All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode of the MCAA Around the World webinar series. This type of webinar is run on, um, each month on the second Friday, and the next one is going to be about policy. So keep an eye on our Twitter and LinkedIn accounts to find more details about how to register to the next webinar. But today we have a fast Cedric, who is going to speak about data visualization. He is born and based in Berlin in Germany, trained biologist with a PhD in ecology with a focus on disease dynamics and animal movement. He combines skills in data analysis with R with the passion for design to create complex GGPLO2 visualizations as scientific figures and as contributions to the community challenges. He decided to become an independent data visualization specialist in 2019. Since 2020, he is working as a consultant, designer, and workshop trainer. He still is working part time as a researcher at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research in Berlin, two days per week. Hello, Cedric, and welcome to the webinar. And thank you very much for joining today. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the invitation. Should I just go on? Thanks for a nice introduction, by the way. <laughs> I will you. share my screen and then just start. OK. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to talk about data visualization. So my uh, talk is entitled Effective Data Visualization Design Graphics to Test Stories in an Engaging Way. So let's see if the slides work. Yes, so there was already an, some introduction to, um, on my side. And so Cedric Scherer um, is my name. I'm also um, an ecologist, but mostly working as an independent data visualization specialist. And I'm consulting, coaching, and mostly coding, but this is not what the um, talk will be about. We will talk about data visualization per se, just to get an idea. So this, these are some figures and charts I have created during my PhD thesis, um, all of them done in ggplot2. And if I participate in my personal projects or other data visualization projects, which are not for academia, these might look like those. Um, on the left hand, we have several contributions. And on the right hand, we are pretty proud um, that we made it into the Scientific American end of the last year with a visualization on drought, which will be featured in this talk as well. I have a web page where I not that often, but sometimes share some thoughts on um, data visualization, on current topics, and also on challenges and coding. If you like, you can visit it at cedricsharer.com. So we're talking about data visualization. Um, first, might be good to define what's data visualization. And there are many definitions out there. One, for example, is that data visualization is any graphical representation of information and data. So basically, we are confronted with data visualization every day because graphical representation is what we see and information and data, especially nowadays, is all around us. You could also de um, define it in a more technical way. You can say data visualization converts information into visual forms as quantifiable features. So this is a more um, mechanistic approach or um, so quantifiable features, something which we can measure which represents our information, means our data. I like to phrase it in that way, that we um, put the aim of data visualization more into focus. So um, in the best case, data visualization helps to amplify cognition, gain insights, discover, explain, and make decisions. So there are multiple use cases for data visualization, but what's definitely also the case is that data visualization involves both art and science. So you need to kind of like be aware of design principles. You may want to make it to be effective and engaging. So maybe also aesthetically pleasing. At the same time, you need to know how to represent the quantifiable features and how to do your statistics and what's the type of your data and so on. So data visualization could look like this come with these good old school office Excel graphs, um, pie charts, 3D bar charts and 3D, colorful. You could also think of data visualization like that. I think most talks feature this graphic by um, Charles Minard, which um, is one very famous graphic, which is actually part, um, just part of a, of a um, panel of two maps, which show the progress of troops. So in brownish color, the, the troop the number of troops, the width of the um, brown color bars is the width, is the number of soldiers going towards their, um, 
their um, aiming location and black is going back. So here in that case, in the upper one, it's um, the troops of Hannibal and in the lower one, the Napoleon map, which became very famous and is considered often as the best statistical graphic ever because it's encoding many things at once. It's encoding the spatial position, the number of soldiers and the width of these bars. It's also encoding the temperature um, below that and it's also encoding time. Another famous one I want to mention is the Rose Diagram by Florence Nightingale, which shows the um, causes of mortality in the army. And um, here she wanted to highlight that most of the deaths um, can be prevented by, um, 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 by um, preventing diseases in the soldiers, not so much um, by fighting deaths, but more um, deaths are coming from diseases. And on the right hand, you see that the blue bars are very, or slices are very long. And on the left hand, they are getting smaller over time. And it's the influence of um, health here, please. So I like to think about what makes it a good data visualization. We learn from other graphics, so such like these old ones, these classical um, examples, or also more recent ones. Um, here's one by, um, by Derek Watkins from the New York Times. And if we have a look at this graph, um, you maybe don't agree that this is a good data visualization. I personally find it a very exciting one. Um, design-wise and also from a, from a data point of view and also from a storytelling point of view. If we have a look here, um, what makes it a good data visualization is actually that there's a story, so there's something to tell, and that story is put in front, so the goal is reached by showing that chart and with the help of colors, annotations, and so on. So we can think about it um, in different boxes. Um, there are many classifications on that. Um, I like to go with this one. So um, first it's important that the information um, is there, so the data level, the integrity of the data, and that we have something to tell. So the story and the inter interestingness of this data. Then we want to have, uh, want to reach a goal. So the usefulness of the visualization per se. And in the end, we should take care of the visual form. So we could also say the beauty or the design. So here there are rules that we need to apply that people can easily um, read and interpret our chart, but also just aesthetically that they find it pleasing and um, attractive. These four categories come from this visualization by Information is Beautiful, David McCandless. Um, if you want to have a closer look, it's linked here. Let's start with, the, with this first part, which is information. Understand your data and be accurate. I don't want to spend too many words on that. Um, I'm just two learnings from this great book, Avoiding Data Pitfalls by Ben Jones. So the first one is, our data is never a perfect reflection of the real world. It sounds obvious, it is maybe also obvious, but you always need to remind yourself. I trapped in that, I think everyone trapped into that pitfall already that we just get lost in our data and we just think whatever we see here is actually the case. But to remind you, this is only a subset. So in that case, I just tweeted about it a few minutes ago. It's not crime, it's reported crime. It's measured something, it's surveyed something, but it's not crime per se. It's collected by humans, so we might have precision and errors and guesstimation in there. The same is true for machines, so always check your data for problematic input and always keep in mind that this might be the case. And of course we try to deal with this, but it's always only a subset of our real world. As an example, I brought um, this graphic from the annual disaster statistical review. So here we see the number of disasters over time. And as you see that the disasters and um, especially the earthquakes increased very heavily and you could now think oh gosh they are all damned but actually this is just um, because we um, have better um, better ways to collect this information so it's more a reported disaster increase and not a disaster per se so it's very likely that it's just by an, an improvement in information access and not actually an increasing number of earthquakes and so on the second learning is that the best use of data is to teach us what isn't true. So it's always easy to 
like find something what you think you want to show with your data so you go hunting in your data and you will likely filter your data to something which supports your claim but it might be better to search for something which you want to falsify so it's better to um, state a falsifiable universal statement something like all ones are white and you're searching for the black one and that's um, something you can prove why the single statement this one this one strand is white doesn't tell us much about the truth you could say for all of the strands the next part is the story so we want to be clear about the message of your um, of our visualization or in that case if you're designing it your visualization which means when we design this graphic we should always keep in mind what we want to tell we are here to talk about um, graphics which are presented to some audience not for internal use for detecting patterns but we want to tell something we want to convince somebody we want to make somebody listen or to make decisions based on our graphics so there should be something um, which we want to show this audience and the first good questions are is, is who is actually my audience because depending on that you might use that chart or the other one and that refers first to the story so which story is actually interesting for my audience the story might be different if it's for some some very specific group let's say a group of scientists which are trained in a specific field or if it's for the general public or lay persons then you should always keep in mind um, that not all the details might be relevant to your audience so um, carefully pick the the ones that that are relevant to include and try to avoid to put all the information into one chart because often it's overwhelming you know your data very well but that's not the case for the person looking just at the chart which variables are meaningful to them is another important factor so it's maybe better to just show a, a rather in, intuitive uh, metric than showing some abstract um, index um, or calculated summary statistics and if so then keep in mind is it something the audience should know or might it be better to explain it carefully and then of course it's also important how they encounter the visualization because depending on that you might add some annotation if it's a static graphic which you share on social media or put on a web page or if it's in a presentation if you're talking about it you might not need any annotation which the people can't read anyway but you will explain it step by step and thus reveal it also step by step and you can explain it otherwise you might take care of different font sizes depending on which medium people consume it and in the end i hate to say it but sometimes you may, may not even need a visualization so keep in mind um, also if it's really needed to draw something which is actually only includes two numbers which are actually quite the same or something like that so one example I like to bring are these very famous warming stripes. I assume most of the people in the room will know it by Ed Hawkins. So these show the, the um, increase of temperature um, over time. Actually, it's compared to a baseline. And very intuitively, we see that it's getting hotter because we associate emotionally red with hot, um, hot temperatures and blue with rather cold temperatures. And there's no annotation. There's not even any axis on that graph. And because it became so popular and famous, most people now know what it means. Also because it's pretty intuitive for us living in the West to read from the left to the right, and also to read red colors as warm temperatures, that might be very intuitive. We'll find a slightly annotated version, where that is at least a title, so it gives you some idea of the range from left to right, from 1850 to 2019 in our case, and then also had some annotation on the bottom, but that's it. If you want to get more information, you consider um, consolidate the frequent, frequently asked questions on that page and I found it very interesting also to see that there's the question why are there no numbers on the graphics and it states that these graphics are specifically designed to start con con conversations about our warming world so it's meant to be interpreted it's meant to be that people don't get it in the first place start questioning start looking for more information on that and then that it also triggers con conversations and that people talk about the topic and it became kind of a symbol so you see it 
often on covers and for example here German football team has it always printed um, in, in the stadium and so on. So it became really a sign there are flags on Friday for future um, demonstrations and so on. So that's an interesting showcase. In general, uh, we have some control over what people interpret and comprehend from our um, or perceive and interpret from our visualization. But in the end, there might be some interpretation and comprehending, which is out of our control. And we should do our best to give the viewer the information if we want to have a kind of like a clear, final, comprehending message. Um, so from left to right, we kind of like have most control to the left and then goes to the viewer. So what do I see? What is perceived? And then what does it mean for this particular subject? So we interpret it. And then in the end, what does it mean for me as a viewer, as a reader? One of the best examples for this, or at least what I find one of the best examples is um, this article, How Maps in the Media Make Us More Negative About Migrants, which is about this graphic by Frontex about number of illegal border crossings in 2018. And it's a very interesting piece. It's, it's a storytelling piece, so feel free to click on the link when I share the slides with you. And here it shows with red, big, and some smaller arrows um, the number of immigrants to European out on different routes. And the authors here say that this kind of visualization makes us think very negative about that topic and they are kind of like propose several other solutions to that and I want to present some of them to you as well. So the first or one of the first steps you could, could think about if you want to change the story of that graphic. So I assume Frontex picked these um, big red arrows for a reason. Um, you could say, okay, let's shrink them a bit and let's remove this red warning color. So on the, red, uh, on the right hand, you see the, the remade version, which maybe looks already less ex aggressive. Also take a note that the title has changed. So now it reads irregular migrants reach the EU, European Union via these routes. So the, the, the full framing is very different and the data is the same, even the presentation, the chart or the map is the same, but the story changed. You could even go further and say like, okay, these arrows remind us of um, invasion, as we also see it now in the Russian uh, war against Ukraine. So um, in many of these maps and it's just kind of like, let's think of some invasion of course, it should, um, or maybe it's intention, the intention is that it should show movement. But we could also say like, okay, this is the Eastern route. We just mark the, one of the places where the migrants move through with some bubbles and the bubble area is sized by the numbers of migrants here. You could also kind of like dig a bit deeper and get some other data and put it in context. So now we are leaving the, the same data perspective, um, but we are still talking about migration um, to Europe, but also out of Europe and inside Europe. So we could also talk about migration within the European Union and um, about the emigrants. And then also distinguish, for example, irregular and regular immigrants. And finally, you could say, okay, we don't want to look at the spatial patterns, but more on the temporal patterns. Now the story has changed a lot, but also the chart has changed a lot. So we see that actually the numbers in 2018 are pretty low, especially compared to 2015 and 2016. With that, we come to our goal, and we already touched up on this topic um, in the previous example. So it's about chart selection. You have seen different charts here. We have seen charts with arrows on top. We have seen bubble charts. We also have seen bar charts. So there are many charts out there and um, there's not likely the one perfect visualization for, for a specific data set. So it's always kind of like nice to see what people do with the same data set. And um, there are many, that's what's also challenges are interesting for. So there are many different ways how you could tell the story with um, um, a specific chart type. But it's important to keep in mind what's the story and might be also important to talk about a bit of the, about the typology of these kind of question, um, um, graphics. So in the first step, as proposed by, for example, Coponen and Hillman in their book from 2020, 
um, is the information conceptual or measurable? And depending on that, you might create something which is we call like a data visualization, a true data visualization in the context that we transform data into visual form, or if it's more conceptual, we might just show something which you would call the term infographics or something like that. So more conceptual figure. And then we could classify it into the purpose of something, which is um, either explore, explain traditionally. So um, in the case of exp exploration, it's used mostly internally. There are also explorative, um, explorative gra um, um, graphics out there where, where the user can interact with the graphic, which is also presented to the public. Um, but here we want to facilitate the discovery. On the other end, if we talk about ex explanatory data visualizations about communication, so we want to make the story clear and easy to understand. Um, so this is the visualization in the, or the conceptual figure. It's not a visual, data visualization, but a visualization and um, conceptual scheme of these two axes. So we have the conceptual measurable axes on, on the um, from the left to the right, and then explanatory to exploratory from the top to the bottom. And here is also how they classify the names of these specific things. I don't think there are strict borders to that. So what's considered data visualization, what's considered information graphics, and what's considered um, a conceptual figure, for example, might shift depending on who you ask. Interestingly, I just spoke about that um, with, for example, Alberto Cairo and Emily Kirk, about the explore, explain gradient. And I, like, I actually like their, um, their proposal that we could also have a, um, a third measurement. So we basically form a triangle that we say either is the purpose is ex explore, explain, or affect others. So there it's more about emotions or maybe a bit more about some artistic approach, not so much about communicating information and maybe also not so much about discovery, but more for the joy and fun of it. And I brought two um, references here. Um, quotes, one again from Alberto Cairo here from the data sketches book. And I really like it um, because it puts all the variety of data visualization which we see in there. And I know there are people who kind of put it very strict. So this should be a bar chart and nothing else. But I like, I celebrate the variety of data visualizations out there. I love colors. I'm not so much thinking about data ingratious in my personal projects, for example. And reflecting on the purpose of a visualization is paramount before we design it or before we critique it. And I think that's important as well. So if you see a data visualization out there which doesn't make sense to you or you think you could do it better, maybe give it a try and give con constructive critique, but also think about maybe it's not a business visualization, but just for the fun of it. And in the same, in the same sense, also uh, Morris Stefana put it, that the common truism about information visualization is that it's primarily about showing the data. But this might be true for scientific, financial, or other application fields, but there are also other use cases of visualization, which maybe are not, where it's not important to show the precise number or to show it in a neutral way. But if we are talking more about these scientific visualizations or representing actual numbers, um, there's this classical um, experiment by Harry Bostock and Cleveland and McGill, where it's about what we should use as a visual form to, um, well, what we, not what we should use, but what works best um, in communicating quantifiable information. And here we see on the bottom the examples, um, how we could, for example, show different amounts or, and compare them to each other. And on the top, you see the um, the error of people in trying to quantify these numbers. And you see that if the bars have the same baseline and are put next to each other here in the, in the first example, you see that the error is the lowest and then it gets more difficult if these have, are having not the same baseline or get further apart or if they are put on top of each other. So here we measure position so we can directly read it off the um, X scale while here we need to um, interpret the length of the bars and then compare them to each other. So this is already something which we need to do in addition. So always consider also if you have kind of like these grouped dotched bars with 
two groups or more, then think about what's more important comparing this group inside here or comparing it like that. So if you want to compare the blue and the orange one, put them together as close as possible. There's also an extended version um, where we see then that area makes the things also um, a bit more prob problematic or um, angle. So for pie charts, bubble charts, and tree maps and stuff like that. So everything should be a bar. Um, it's maybe just a phrase, but could be true, but would be also very boring, right? But if you kind of like want to do bubble charts because you don't want to see more bars, then please use area, don't use the radius. I had a recent discussion about it. Um, maybe area is also not the best choice, but um, definitely um, these bubble charts are hard to interpret. That's maybe the main message of this discussion. And you should aim for something else. Um, but if it's not about the exact numbers, test them, ask people how they interpret them. But I think with the radius here in that case, it's really hard to interpret the chin strap and has, has half the number of the Adeli species, but that might be also depending on how your brain works. So maybe you use bars um, or maybe you decide it's not that important to really quantify them, but be aware that these might be interpreted in different ways. They are presented as bubbles. And on that note, um, Nicoletta asked me, to also mention um, a few slides on text analysis and how to present this data. And I know that's, I mean, I'm not, not an expert in that field, but I know that they are kind of like the word clouds are famous. And I want to talk a bit about word clouds and other um, possible alternative visualizations. And I found this fun word cloud about why we don't use word clouds here. And there are many problems with this. And I know that word clouds are kind of like many people like them because they are, I don't know, I, I think they spark a lot of interest. That's maybe the most important reason here. But the information is hardly quantifiable. So how are the, those size? How do I compare them? Smaller ones are easily lost and hard to read, for example. Uh, most often the context is not provided. So you kind of like Google for word clouds, you will find many word clouds and you can just say like, oh, these are the most common words, but in which context, for example, of course, this should do a title and so on. But also there's rarely a classification um, in terms of sentiment. They also rarely provide insights into patterns. So what do I learn from it? So maybe there's three big words and I know, okay, these are very common, but how do they interact are there maybe other hierarchies? Can they be grouped into something else? And um, the colors are often not meaningful. So they are just colored by size or randomly just for aesthetical reason. But you could do also something else. But um, let's speak about word clouds. I also did them for fun. So this was also the topic here. This is a contribution to Tidy Tuesday where I um, was analyzing the um, ratings on Animal Crossing. This was, a, I'm not sure if it's still a famous game, it was a famous game in 2020, I think, 2019, 2020. And when analyzing this, and, uh, with, um, on this based on the sentiment of the words, I found out that fun was very prominent and it was actually termed in a positive way. But actually, many of the ratings were stating something like not much fun, no fun at all, a fun game that I wanted to play, but what a shitty multiplayer mode, for example. So um, it's also important to get those in context. So this was a fun visualization for me. Of course, there are also other words. You could do the same with, with uh, not amazing, for example. So there's definitely also a good idea to use something like a bigram or an n-gram, where you consider several words that follow after each other. But we could also show the information in a different way. And I played around a bit like that. And let's assume that these words are really positive and negative connotated in a strict sense. Then I found it um, very interesting to sort them by basically how often they appear. And then um, in the middle, you basically see the trends. So here we have different grades. Um, it's not so much important what the visualization here really says, but we see some, some change in the positive and negative connotation in that case. So that's basically a line chart which um, emerges from our sorting and coloring of the different groups. Alternatives 
could be just again as always bar charts so here we could explicitly show the frequencies the small ones wouldn't get lost because we could have the same size of the labels on the axis for example network diagrams are very powerful to highlight the relationships so you can show which words appear together and also you can form clusters and highlight these i also oh i see these are doubled here and I also found Senke diagrams, which um, were used to illustrate hierarchies. So basically we have a joy category and then there are different, different words that make up joy. And then we have an, another level. So you can show the split of these different groups. This is one example I found about um, a network on, opi on opinions about net neutrality. Um, they did some fancy machine learning, topic modeling here, um, as it seems. I found it very appealing, and I think also the level of annotation, it's very nice. Still more in a scientific and business context, I think it's also a good idea to reconsider graphics which have um, been proven not ideal for some use cases. And this paper by Tracy Weisgerber and colleagues from 2015 it's a very nice example. I also like to um, show in case that people need to argue with a reviewer, for example, why they have used not the standard bar graph with an error bar on top. And here's the problem of these bars, bar, bar, bar plots, some people call them, or dynamite plots. Um, these are actually showing the summary of some distribution. And the distribution of the black and white might look like in the, like in the panel B. But you could also come up with um, multiple distributions which form, would form the same bar, exact same bar, but would end up in different interpretation if you compare the groups statistically. It's not only about um, the distribution, but also, of course, about the number of samples in each of these bars. And then you could still show the um, summary statistics, so you could add some marker which shows the, the mean value in that case. You could, of course, also put the error bars next to it. So we would still have the same information as in the bars, but additional information on the sample size and the distribution. If you have paired measurements, it's even more interesting, uh, interesting to not show them as bars, but as um, slopes here. So basically, we kind of draw the distribution and we connect the pairs of it, so the measurement before and after something. And then we might reveal some other patterns then just saying this is the, the after um, measurement is higher than the other one on average, but we would maybe see a general trend or some opposing trends or maybe two groups. And again, here's an example how you can also could just show the difference between those instead of showing the raw data if you transform the data accordingly. And again, you could also show the summary slope on top of that, as I have also done last year for one contribution to the LDA chart challenge, which is also currently running here, comparing different um, countries and their urban population over time. And in general, I like to play around with maybe more unusual combinations. And I also like very much the idea of hybrid graphs, so putting together several of those. So I'm totally liking box plots with raw data plotted on top. Um, or for example, I'm a, I'm a big fan of these um, interval strips, which show basically where most of the data falls. And here I combined them with a, um, with a dot plot. So you can explicitly see the, the number and how, they, how the sample size differs between countries here, but also the full range and um, directly see where the data falls. Another example um, of encoding multiple dimensions into one chart is something we call a dumbbell chart. So we can connect the dots. And actually, sometimes we have here in that case three dots. But this is a work I did for a client for the Afro Census 2020, Citizens for Europe, and each one teach one. And here we encode um, the feedback from a survey. And with the size, we um, encode the sample size. Then we have direct labels, what exactly these dots mean. And then we also have two groups, if they are um, privileged or non-privileged. 
And now if you're thinking about how can I find some inspiration, um, how can I even know what's out there beyond a pie chart and a bar chart and line chart and so on, there are multiple chart selection helpers out there. I like these three for, as an example. So the data to this is great. You have these kind of decision tree that you can go through, uh, which hopefully works in most of the cases, um, but also the data this project, for example, gives you kind of a large variety of different chart types and the visualization universe also groups them somehow by um, popularity. And so if you can either go for the very popular ones or if you want to be edgy, you go for the least popular ones. One use case I want to show is the um, small approach of small multiples, which is not per se a chart type, but um, the same chart in multiple versions. So um, one example I brought here was a makeover I did with a colleague together. And here's the original graphic where we kind of like see at least a pattern, but it's hard to focus on one of the lines. I don't actually know what's the story here. So um, I made several makeovers and one was a small multiple. So let's assume all of them are equally important. I thought it might be nicer to have a look at them in separation. But in addition, we draw the other ones in light gray, so I still can see how the other perform, so I don't need to go up and down as a reader. And um, I also mark the area above or below. You could even color encode those. The color encoding here might be not worth it. Um, this was just to match the original visualization. These small multiples we also used for the visualization I showed you quickly in the beginning, um, which we published in the Scientific American. Where it's about drought data and lots of drought data for um, for different um, we climatic hubs, climatic hubs, and um, for different years, and then we have information on a weekly basis. So we tried different things, but came up um, eventually with this kind of like big small multiple, big small multiple is hundred. Um, so here then it's a zoom in so you can really go in and have a look at each individual pattern, but also overall you see where there are clusters where there's lots of drought going on or not so much. Another example here where I compared um, college basketball clubs, um, women college basketball clubs in the US and their trends um, over time and a very famous one I brought brought to you is by Aaron, uh, which was um, went viral quite some yeah, few weeks ago, um, where she shows um, where the Americans are born. If they are born outside in the USA, it's the orange part, and then born elsewhere it's, um, in the US, light blue, and then born in the same state in blue. And you see these nicely this gradient towards more and more dark blue here, with um, more and more orange going on here on the west and the upper. I also used it um, for some more experimental visualization of um, the electricity generated by European countries. So here, the size encodes the amount of energy and the green slice shows the green, the re renewable energy part. And this is um, a so-called geofacet of Europe. So they are kind of like these geofacets or these small multiples in a spatial context out there for many, many reasons. We recently also created one um, specifically for the German election. So these are the different um, um, districts where people voted. Okay. And the final bit. And I guess the largest one is on the visual form. So about design rules, data visualization principles, and as requested quite some bit on colors. Let's see, let's get zoom out of the way. Okay. So let's start with some, some examples how you might increase the readability of your chart. So let's assume the most common use case of a bar chart. So this is showing weekend cross in, in American dollars for uh, five chosen um, movies here, blockbusters. And the first um, thing you could do is order your data, order the bars by whatever metric you have, or not only the bars, your box plots, um, even, even your raw data points, which show a distribution. 
uh, which makes it easier, of course, to interpret the ranking. Um, only do that, of course, if there's no intrinsic order here. So it might be not that useful if you sort them by value if it's about a time series, but in case you have um, categorical data without an intrinsic order, this is often helpful. The next tip is don't rotate your text. I know it can be difficult in a, in a, in a scientific publishing context, but um, the trend is that we put the y-axis title on top or maybe even both access titles. So we could just say weekend cross a million US dollars of popular blockbusters. Most people will also recognize that these are blockbusters and we try to avoid kind of these um, uh, rotated access texts here. So people don't need to tilt their head when they want to read it. So you could go for a bigger graphic, a bigger font size, or maybe a line break, or you could also flip your chart and then put it on the y-axis. So this is a very neat trick if you have very long labels. Some people like it, some don't, but you could also add direct labels here. So if it's really about the exact numbers, you could put them next to the bars, um, which also highlights basically the end. So I can go here. Um, some people then keep the axis, for example, in the grid line. Some people don't like it because they say it's double information and it's useless if I have the exact numbers here. I tend to agree with them sometimes, but I also like to have grid lines nevertheless. I think you will also see an example later. Um, but that's definitely something you can consider. And then if you want to use colors, I just colored them here according to my theme. Of course, they could be all gray, but maybe if you want to really tell a story, you could use colors and annotations to make people focus on maybe the Star Wars movie here, which has the highest weekend cross in our, in our example, or maybe on another one, which your article is about or whatever, and which context you're using this visualization. And I asked around on Twitter about some examples of about the power of annotations. And I got, for example, this one by Neil Richards, and um, I like it a lot. So this is the un annotated version about the rise and fall of the name Neo in the USA. Of course, you see the pattern, but you kind of like would ask yourself, why did it peak? Why did it peak again? And why did it drop afterwards? And if you kind of like add some annotation here, it kind of like gives you lots of insights, what's going on. And suddenly the graph makes much more sense. It's not just purely information of the rise and fall, but also why, the why and the story. So we reach to go way better. And this is nothing new. So this is also a very famous and um, yeah, quite old example of a data visualization. Um, I think also considered as one of the first um, by William Playfair. And um, he already used lots of annotation here to um, first of all highlight the areas, but also if you take a close look, he highlighted the different lines and even twice so you can easily follow them. More recently, um, John Byrne Murdoch was, well, yeah, was and is unfortunately still presenting lots of graphs with um, many annotations on the COVID pandemic. So these are just two examples from him, this heavily annotated one from the very beginning of the pandemic and on the right end, um, a more recent one on the vaccination and how, how we hopefully get out of it, of this pandemic. And in um, an interview, he said that text and other annotations add an enormous value for non-chart people. And so that's one of the first thing they are going to add as an additional information. So people who see it directly get the story, but also if it's getting reshared, uh, get out of the context of the article that it can tell the story on its own, basically. Another example people pointed me to is, is this one about the, about, um, the gun sells, sellings in the US. And also here again, just the line would maybe give you an idea, but not kind of like the story, what's, what's going on, and maybe also might look a bit less interesting. And another one, this is one of my examples. So when I hit the 10,000 followers on Twitter, I decided to kind of like make the con try connected scatter plot. So here, time is encoded with color, and we have the impressions on the x axis and the follows on the y-axis and actually um, here I also decided to annotate these events to kind of like highlight 
why there was a recent peak, for example, or maybe also not highlight why there was a drop. So I'm going to check the chat, there's something. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to address that later. Um, the last bit is on colors and color pitfalls. So if you use the color, um, then use it wisely. I like to bring this example by our world and data, and I al always want and have to say that I really acknowledge the work of our world and data, and I love all of them, what they do, and um, how easily they provide access to data and also to data insights. But I'm really getting, <laughs> getting a bit mad about these colorful bar graphs here. And I want to propose the problem here. Uh, I want not want to propose a problem. I want to illustrate the problems here and also want to propose some other approaches to that visualization. So this particular visualization is about the carbon footprint of travel per kilometer. And it basically highlights that flying and driving a car, it's kind of like having the highest footprint. And then if you go down here, we find, um, for example, rails and ferries, which have a very low one. And when I addressed um, this on Twitter, um, Hannah was creating um, a different version. So um, this was the proposed other versions, which now doesn't use random colors here, so, um, but uses the diverging one. So the problem on the left hand for me was actually that I immediately tried, maybe I'm kind of like, too much thinking in a data visualization design context, but I was immediately trying to figure out if there's a gradient in these or if the domestic flight, for example, might be connected with a petrol car. And I think this is a very good opportunity to use color in a context that it supports your story. And unfortunately, the diverging one also doesn't help much, especially if it's just scaled from bottom to top by rank and not by the actual number here. And we see that the bus is hardly visible and also why is bus basically the, the middle point? Is it something meaningful? Is bus what most people drive? I don't know, but I don't think so. Um, I created this one, which is a double encoding. So some people might argue with me, okay, just pick gray ones. So here I encode by color the length of the chart of each bar. So basically the carbon footprint in gram per passenger and kilometer. Um, but I think it already drives your eyes more towards the, the upper ones than to the lower ones. While here, for me, it's actually really hard to focus on one of the bars when I'm just flipping around. And this is about the types of color palettes. So you, you need to be aware what kind of information you have and then pick the color based on that. And in our case, we have now seen the sequential one in my version, in my remake, which is um, a color palette which usually goes from dark to light or light to dark. We can e either have one color, so basically um, a gradient of blues, or also have different colors, so going from yellow to green to um, purple, for example, for the river disk color palette. And this is used to encode numerical information, which has some order. So where we have kind of like a numeric value, which goes from something very low to something very high. And uh, usually we want to use the highest contrast for the most important information. So in most cases, this will be the highest value on a white background. So we use the dark color for the high values. But if you have a dark background, for example, and um, then you might want to use the lightest color. The other proposed version with the very light bus bar um, was a diverging one. And the diverging one should only be used if you encode numeric information with a critical midpoint. So the midpoint should, should have some meaning. And it's also important to use the balance um, palette, so which means that the extremes are, are the same. So don't make the error to cut them off. Um, so if you have kind of like the, the same color, uh, the same value, kind of like the absolute values on both ends, that's fine. But let's assume that the, the brown one here is plus five and the green one is minus two. That's bad, so you might likely want to shift the minus two somewhere here. So it's really balanced, so each step is linear perceived. So basically one step in the number also represents one step in the color intensity. And it's basically a combination of two sequential palettes. So it's going from usually light in the middle towards dark, which makes it also always hard to read when it's um, printed in grayscale. Um, but 
there are definitely diverging color palettes, which also work for colorblind people. This is a nice example by Lisa Mood from Data Rapper um, to illustrate how the story can change when using sequential or divergent color palettes. So it's the same data, the title is different, but the data is the same, and the color palette is different. And on the left hand, we have a sequential data palette, um, color palette, and on the right hand, we have a diverging one. And so the left one gives the impression, or the goal would be, and the story and the goal would be to kind of highlight the Western world or the countries where the internet was mostly used while on the diverging version, there we can focus on both. So we see the extremes in both ends that we also have countries which kind of like have not much internet usage, which kind of like gets lost a bit on the sequential one because we use the very light colors. So here the midpoint is meaningful because it's basically the 50% split and the both are totally fine and valid, but it really depends on what the story you want to tell. And the last one is the qual qualitative color palette, so which is used to encode categorical information. And here we should take care that we have distinct colors, um, with, which have to usually the same perceptual weight. So you see if it's des desaturated, it's kind of like the same gray. Um, if we don't want to highlight a single category or several categories, otherwise you definitely could also um, use highlight colors and you should usually limit your colors to six to eight categories. Um, some people say 10, but at some point it gets hard to distinguish. And in the case of the um, original bar graph, this category information was um, there, but it was, I think, more than six and also it was completely random and also for me a bit too vibrant. So I came up with uh, another different version here and I think it's um, a very nice data set to use color in a way that we um, group the data into different uh, modes of transportation. So we have railways, for example, waterways, motorways and airways. And if you take a closer look at the original bar chart or at the data, you will realize that basically the, the three that have the lowest one are waterways and railways and all the others are motorways and airways and then i also flipped it because for me the message is take the train of course the message could be also it's kind of like the vice versa message so don't don't fly especially not um, take domestic flights so i flipped the bars here and i also added grid lines even though i have direct annotation to kind of give an idea how uh, what's the factor of a national rail? I also annotate like this. So you see that a domestic flight is kind of like the carbon footprint times six of a national rail. If you use these color palettes, so I pick them by hand, but also if you use color palettes which are out there, there are definitely also some out there which are um, well designed and are kind of colorblind safe. But in general, the suggestion is to test them. So here, I'm illustrating a tool I'm using. There are many tools like these out there where you just get a window which you pop um, on top of it. And here you can see that the colors um, likely work. Also, um, we can see that these colors are more extreme than these. So they definitely have not the same perceptual weight, but that's what's on purpose because I wanted to focus on the first three bars here. So how to pick colors, um, there's a great tool I'm often using, which is the RIS palette by Elijah Mix and Susie Lu. And here you can put in your um, hex colors or even RGB or HSL encoded colors. And then you can also simulate different um, types of color blindness and check your, um, if the colors work. And another note here, it also depends a lot how vibrant or how different the colors need to be, depending if the um, colors touch up on each other and also if you kind of have large areas that fill up or if you have, for example, lines, words or tiny dots. So they get harder to distinguish, no matter if you are colorblind or not, but likely even more if you're colorblind. You can also have a look in grayscale, so that's what I meant. Two colors here are darker than the other two, but that was on purpose in my case. But you see that these colors are almost the same and these colors are almost the same, which means it will not work when it's printed, but um, it gives the, gives the focus on two of, out of four groups here. And if you like, you can also play around directly in the tool with the background color and the font color, so you can 
quickly um, change it and also see if it works on a darker background. So here, for example, it will, might get problematic. Gives you also kind of a color report at the bottom. So where it kind of like says no color conflicts and also no color name conflicts. So if you need to kind of like to specify these in your alternative text to even increase your accessibility, um, or if you kind of like need to use them for a style guide, for example, um, you can also directly check that. Another tool I found very recently, thanks to Lisa again, is the APCA contrast calculator, which looks super fu futuristic. I, I love it. Um, so this is about the contrast testing. So it's actually more about um, text, not so much about data visualization, but we have a lot of text, and especially if you use titles, annotation, access text, and so on. So here you can um, put in two, two colors. So the text color and the background color, I'm using the, those two I have used in my bar chart example. And then you get some percentages here in the middle, which is 93, which is 100 is the best. So we are kind of like having a high contrast. Um, also note that um, the APCA, this is a, kind of like a new metric, how to measure contrast. Um, um, also distinguishes between text color and background. So if you s flip these, the value will change by the original one, the VG, WGCA contrast uh, metric um, was not taken care of that. And then there are also examples here, if kind of like they work with different font weights and different font sizes. And then just put in the, the other text color, so I have a secondary text color, which is still kind of like have 79%, which also works very well. And then if you check, <clears throat> Some, some of the other colors you get very, very low, but then again, it depends if it's um, showing text or maybe some bars or some other elements. To illustrate that, the blue color of our um, airways then has a critical value if it's about text. So consider something like 45% as the critical value, and then you should um, maybe increase the contrast of your text. And Lisa also compared then the two different, um, oh, I, I had the, had the wrong one, so it's WCAG, so the old contrast metric and the new one, the APCA. And um, the conclusion is that kind of like the, the new better metric allows for lighter gray on light backgrounds, which is good. So you basically can kind of put the text a bit less in focus if you want to take care of the um, right contrast. Um, but also um, it requests lighter gray on dark backgrounds. So it means to likely need to increase the color lightness of your text labels if you're using them on dark backgrounds. And finally, no talk on color without mentioning the rainbow map, the co rainbow color palette or however you want to call it, also the jet one. Uh, so here I brought you um, some articles about these and how they can be um, yeah, mislead you and misguide people. So one article here, rainbow color map still considered harmful, but also really about problems when using these colors for interpretation uh, in a medical context, um, but also in um, the hyd hydrology research and likely any research. Um, and in this paper here, for example, they, they state that the inconsistent diagnostic decisions with a negative um, of, of these colors um, has a negative impact on the pa 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 patient treatment and the prognosis. I went to a talk once, um, it's quite a while ago, but I really also talked about this, that actually it's not highlighting the, the areas which are of most interest. Um, so there are cases where these information get lost or overseen and they claim as also the others that we should use a better color palette. So what's actually a problem here? This is um, the so-called rainbow color map. And the problem here is that we have non-uniform distances between these um, different colors. So it means that we don't have a linearly scaled um, color. So for example, this, this step here in the, in the yellow one is very steep. And here again in the light blue one, where we have a very smooth gradient in the red, the orange, and the green parts, which kind of like ends up with jumps and you automatically may focus on these areas instead of the extremes. To illustrate that, I'd like to show this example by Fabio Carmel. So here's the original image of his friend, uh, Phil. And if we put the rainbow color on top, 
So we encode the image by lightness and then we um, apply the rainbow color palette. Then it looks like this and you immediately, immediately see that this is not linearly scaled because this is not how full actually looks like. If you use a, a linearly scaled and um, perceptually safe color palette, it's still not the same image, but you can directly see the face of his friend Phil. This brings me to the wrap up. Uh, so we covered four different steps. So the first step is our information. So the data level, I didn't spend much time here, but the important thing is understand your data. And of course, if you are communicating data, try to be as accurate as possible. Then the next level is story. So always be clear about the message of your visualization. If you review a visualization, always ask yourself or the person presenting the visualization to you, kind of like what's the, the story? Does it really kind of like um, match? So is the goal matched by the by the chart the person or yourself, yourself have chosen? And in the end, of course, take care that people also ha have a look at your data visualization. You spend a lot of time to create those. So also please take care that um, people look at it. And I personally am convinced um, if it's aesthetically pleasing and if you follow general design rules and layout, then um, it makes it a more interesting piece. And um, especially in our fast driven world nowadays and social media and so on, you kind of like need to be engaging and of course follow the general principles of not misguiding people by wrong choices even if it's maybe by accident but feel also free to kind of like address them in the next version and update them okay these are some, some general takeaways so um design for your audience i'm not going to read all of this out as mentioned i give you the slides so the important bit here keep the audience in mind take care of them make it as easy as possible if it's really about insight um, be honest, definitely. So always try to give an idea of the raw data. Um, don't truncate bar charts. We didn't talk about that specifically. Um, and also there are opposing opinions on that. Um, and be consistent with access scaling if you have small multiples, for example. And I think lending a helping hand is very helpful. So add annotations, add direct labels, um, order your bars and focus on the main message. and be honest about it, but also communicate it and don't assume that the image alone speaks a thousand words or however you say it. Thank you very much and I'm open for any questions. So let's have a look. There's some activity. Yes, thank you, Cedric. <laughs> there are several uh... So, well, quite a lot of questions and um, that's good. Do you want to start? I mean, I think it's better if you if you can pick one where like you can go for them or do you mm -hmm. want? Yeah, I definitely first have to read them out. Um, let me see. If someone wants to say it out loud, uh, I think I can give. Yeah, I just start from the top. So then we will I like. So Christina, hi, Christina. Um, asked if we have the same variable measured, for example, fruit size, fruit mass, etc., that are repeating in more charts. I tend to sort those in the same order rather than by the value measured. What is your opinion and experience on that? Um, yeah, um, that's definitely, definitely a good approach. Um, hard to imagine now if they really kind of like are very different. I assume that maybe they follow kind of like the same or the opposite direction. So then it might be not also not that that um, difficult, but um, to kind of compare or not so much different if you sort them or not. Um, the question is would be, what would be your initial sorting? That would be my first question. So the initial sorting might be the, the first variable you present, but maybe also the most important one. And I can think of a use case where I did it. So where I basically had a bar chart um, which was, was sorted for the overall population and then subsets for different populations. And I definitely also kept the same order also because then it clearly shows the differences. So in the context of a kind of like a aggregated information and then a sub information, I find it very interesting because suddenly you see gaps in your ranking. If it's really about different variables, like you said, so food size and food mass, uh, I guess they are correlated. 
Um, I both valid, I think. I, I can't decide which is which is maybe better. Um, if they're presented next to each other, I think keeping the same sorting makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, okay, the next question is on the programming software I'm using. So I guess for the data visualizations. Um, so yeah, as quickly mentioned in the beginning, I'm coming from, from the R programming language. So I'm using the ggplot2 package for many of my visualizations. But nowadays more and more also kind of like graphic design tools. So Figma is for example, one thing I use or also other chart builders, which are online like war graphs or data wrapper or flourish. Uh, also the always depends on the use case. So for example, the, the final our world and data um, carbon footprint bar chart I have designed completely without, well, not true. The first bar output I also created in R, but then I quickly moved on to do it by hand. If it's in a fully reproducible context, like in academia or for also some of my clients, or if you need to host it online or you have data which gets updated regularly, like on a daily basis or weekly basis, then it makes a lot of sense to code as much as possible. Um, there's definitely lots of stuff out there, so I'm sharing in general lots of stuff. So um, if you go either on my on my blog or also on my Twitter, I think the pin tweet has kind of like a long list of the stuff I have out on both theory and also uh, hands-on coding and stuff. Okay, another question on the software tools. So yeah, besides programming, I already mentioned like Figma, then um, the color tool. So my mine is called, I think, just color simulations and other tools I usually use is color pickers, of course, and um, also what the font, so I can find out uh, about cool fonts on, on web pages and stuff like that. So the usual thing, designer help us. Um, and if it's, if it's about designing, yeah, as mentioned, R and ggplot2, uh, raw graphs, data wrapper, flourish, and Figma. What's your take on combining two contradicting information on the same chart? For example, the cost and, the, and cost and accuracy, one being higher has a negative perception and vice versa. But together they tell a story where the optimum solution lies. Um, I need to digest that first. So we have cost and accuracy in the same chart. Um, I'm not sure, maybe this addresses the word cloud and the text analysis. Or do you mean the color palettes? Maybe you can clarify and we come back to that question. Um, yeah, I think the, the tool questions or another question on the tools and software, I hope this is um, addressed for beginners. So if it's really about design, Figma is free and R has definitely something to learn because you kind of like need to code, but I definitely am convinced that this is helpful now and also in the future and it's um, fun most of the time. So it's also for free. Okay. So maybe Bing, Bing Gizu, maybe you can, I hope I pronounce it somehow correctly. Uh, maybe you can specify it. What exactly you mean with the cost and the accuracy, so. Can't really say. Yeah, that's it, I think, for the questions for now. Yeah, maybe I can take the opportunity yeah, sure. and ask a, also a question. Uh, based on your experience, do you start with this data or do you have already the story in mind? And when it comes with data visualization part, or is it both at the same time? Yeah, different. Um, so definitely depends how free I am with the design, definitely. So I guess it's more about the personal projects now or more about the, I'd say more artsy parts. So I mean, in a, in a scientific context, for example, for some clients, it's just clear that we have a white background and we don't have fancy fonts and stuff. Um, if it's for my personal projects, yeah, good question. Um, so if I really have an idea, so I think I have something an idea about a story I hope um, the data kind of like supports and I'm contradicting my own <laughs> my own sayings like not, not showing what you want to sh show but for example like the um, our world and data so the story was already out there for me it was just not really told also the our world and data 
I have to mention, it's not about storytelling so much, it's more presenting the raw data. Um, but there was this story and I was like, constantly coming back to it when giving workshops and seminars and also as, as example, as exercises and stuff. And um, now I created this one. So there I directly had in mind because I knew the data already. Of course, if you don't know the data, you need to explore it first. You may maybe have an idea, but you need to drop it at some point, which can be hard. Um, and with the final design, I think there are some defaults like emotional connections so that you basically go for dark. So we have seen a lot of dark backgrounds in context of Corona, for example. So because people find it scary and also the John Hopkins and I was also among the people who kind of criticized it a bit that we have like these bloody red dots on a dark background, like some horror sci-fi movie or something. Um, but in general, I think there's are some also for me. So if I make something about the war, for example, and it's really showing pessimistic data, I tend to do it in a dark context, um, while opt more optimistic things are definitely more bright and maybe on a white background. So. I think if you think about it or not, a lot of emotional value comes there if you have a feeling for that. And there's, I also wrote a bit about that. And there's also definitely more very interesting context also about the psychology about it or about cultures. So also don't assume that what's kind of like defined in your culture as a color encoding works everywhere in the world, for example. That's kind of like addressing the audience bit. Uh, but I think they are kind of typical picks where you just go for it. And the same for fonts. I also, something I definitely try to address, I once read an article about um, diversity problems of fonts or stereotypic fonts, so that we kind of like have really very stereotype fonts, for example, the Asian culture, right? Or um, So definitely trying to avoid that, but Clearly, there's some style, not saying like these silly font like chopsticks or kind of like, I don't know, but um, kind of like different things like should it be a bold font or should it be more a, a handwritten font or should it be serif to match more like a, um, yeah, not, not so much in your face vibe, but more like, a, a, yeah. Um, how Thank you very much for this. Lay -back, lay -back version. <laughs> Yes, yes. More official version, like often serif fonts, for example, have a more official touch. Like, and this one here, for example, is the font I also use on my web page, which I definitely not, would not use in any context because it's a, kind of like a very uncommon font. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you once again for the collaborated <laughs> response. <laughs> <laughs> so, there is more questions now. Yeah. Mm. Okay, the question is if I draft on paper my design ideas um, or not. I would love to, draw, <laughs> to draft more and to sketch more, actually. I'm always trying to, but I rarely do. So I actually have a drawing background, kind of, so not really a trained one, but I was enjoyed drawing a lot and I was also doing kind of a lot of drawing before my ecological studies. But usually, I directly go to the computer because I need to explore the data. So it really depends. Sometimes there's this kind of like really design part of me. Like I have an idea just like, okay, this might be a cool visualization without context, without the data. It's just like, wow, cool. These two triangles could form up something. So I just draw it to come back to the general style idea. But if I kind of like, if it's really involving data already, which is most often the case, I directly stick to the computer because once I start exploring the data, I'm already inside my coding world and then it's first hard to stop for me and also i mean i'm coding ggplot pretty regularly so it's also quite fast to make the first plots to explore the patterns and often really those go hand by hand because if i see like the distributions are very skewed for example i'm definitely going picking a different route um yeah so most of the time i'm not drawing sometimes i'm really sketching so especially if it's then for comp composing and layout that's something different. So likely if I already have some ideas about the chart or I already have created the charts, then I might draw them first because it can be very time consuming to shift them around and try different setups when coding, purely coding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what percent of the time dedicated to a research project do you think is necessary for planning and executing the, these well 
yeah, well thought designs. Um, yeah, interesting. I, I just uh, talked about that with some colleague um, where I was kind of like sharing that I'm kind of a bit sad about how much time went into all the other stuff, but not the design. Um, I mean, again, I'm a design person, so that's naturally maybe, but I really think like, okay, so in ecology, sometimes you really spend years of collecting and analyzing and collecting more and analyzing again and so on. And then in the end, basically you'll have spent, I don't know, a few days on making the graphs. So not kind of like finding the data, the story. Okay, that's also part of the process as we have seen, but really in the design and cons consolidating also different ways of telling the story, like trying different charts and so on. I mean, I can just talk about my experience and what I see in the direct surroundings. So I'm not saying that everyone it's just doing like, okay, I go for the one obvious chart and then that's it. But I really think that split should be a bit more data -vis. Or maybe I see also the trend that you just have persons for that who can, right, can tell you what maybe would work better or who just take care of it. Because in that discussion, we also came to the point like, okay, what else should I do? I should kind of like collect the data, analyze the data, code, write, design, Kind of sell myself on so obviously in, in academia that's also a, for me also a very crucial topic like the assumption that one person does every part of this kind of like pipeline and um, so i think it would be definitely cool if um, that's not in the hand of people who want to be scientists and i also get totally if some people don't want to spend more on design because it's not what they are into so i totally get if some people say like you're crazy you're spending so much time but i think the best would be kind of just to team these people up so you have the people who have something to tell and you have the people who kind of know how to design it in a way that it tells a story and is engaging so that would be my take here um yeah in terms of person i think it's difficult but i think it should be most often more than it actually is mm. Okay, so now again on the accuracy and the cost. Uh, so it should have low cost and high accuracy. I mean, if, you, if it's now about what chart to pick to kind of be accurate, it's usually a bar chart or a dot plot or something um, like a, um, it, where you really can read it off the axis where you can take out a ruler and read it. Um, so this has definitely the highest accuracy always, or I'll put the numbers next to it. Um, um, yeah, not sure if this addresses the question. Feel free to also write me later. Um, okay, some thoughts on workloads. Agree that they are not that informative, not more accurate, but maybe people like them because of their entertaining component, like a puzzle you have to discover words and that makes it somehow yeah definitely so workloads are definitely engaging um, and we talked about engaging um, charts here and I think workloads also have their place I kind of like have a bit of a problem and so I think they always should yeah again so the story and the goal is important so if your story is um, these are the most common words like these three you can directly read and there are some others or many more others which are not so important then workloads might be a very good pick and at, if at the same time, also, it's kind of like an entertaining graph you want to present. I think you can use them definitely. Um, but if it's about yeah accuracy, so again, it's not saying that don't use ever workloads. So this was just a fun workload I found for, by these people. Um, I not often, but I get the requests kind of from time to time to create a workload. And I'm also having fun with these. But I definitely think especially colors could make difference here so if you create those with a tool and you get random colors maybe think about if you can basically create some hierarchy or some patterns how you yeah doesn't need to be the sentiment can be categories like we have seen before railway and uh, waterway um, related words or something like that but that you can kind of see okay that's interesting and then there's more of a story than just like here these three words are very common you could also write it in a sentence right like the three most used words are Okay. Good. I think there are no questions left in the chat. Thank you everyone for joining.
Thank um, you, Cedric, so much. As someone wrote, indeed, it was a very fantastic seminar. <laughs> thank you very much. I felt a bit like I tripped from here and there, but kind of like, yeah. <laughs> was also some new content here for the first time for you. So I hope you enjoyed it. I'm, I'm going to share the slides. Um, so I think they will be forwarded or placed somewhere where you can download them later. Um, and if there are no more questions, not sure if you have more. Otherwise. Yeah, otherwise we can uh, end. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, OK. Then I hope this helps you. Um, love to see your work. Feel free to tag me here and there. If you, if you have something to share, always happy to, to interact. And yeah, see you somewhere else, digitally, in person, whatever. Indeed, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> to the next event. And being healthy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. Cedric, okay. and thank you also to everyone attending. Yeah, thank you very much. I stopped sharing. Bye-bye, yeah. everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining. <laughs>